What happens when you install a liquid line solenoid backwards? Today we're going to go over the general sequence of operations for this mid-temperature refrigeration equipment behind me. I'm going to show you the difference between the temperatures and pressures of a liquid line solenoid that's installed improperly, incorrectly, and one that's installed properly or correctly. I'm also going to explain to you how this happened. You're watching HVAC Tips for Technicians. I'm Tad. Let's get started. This is the unit cooler. We got the evaporator and we've got five fans. Here is the liquid line solenoid, right? We got the coil on top and I'm using my little pipe clamp to check one side. It says 57 degrees, right? 57 degrees on this side. Let's see what this side says. Wow. That's a 10 degree drop. That's not good. 42. Wow. That is not good. Now how do I know it's backwards? I know it's backwards because it says in right here. In. Out. Step, we're going to recover the refrigerant that I put in thinking it was low. Found the liquid line solenoid to be the problem. Before we can reinstall that, I got to take out that refrigerant. That way it's not overcharged when I start it back up. So over here, we got the recovery machine. We got the recovery tank. And I've got a way to close the suction line and the liquid line service valve once we're ready to pump it down. Also, you can see I've got my adapter cord here. I have the adapter cord hooked up to the recovery machine so we can power it. There's no outside receptacle, so I'm going to pull power from the contactor. This is the line side of the contactor and I've got it hooked up to one leg of the power and then the ground. And I've got one wire off of the contactor coil so that whenever I apply power, the contactor coil does not energize and the contactor doesn't close, sending power to the compressor because I don't want the recovery machine running while the compressor's running. It's probably not a good idea. Got the scales ready to weigh that refrigerant into that tank so I know exactly how much I recover. Zeroed the scales. Now, open up. All right. Once I open it up, this is open in and out. I'm gonna bleed this. bunch of air in there all right now we're ready disconnect is on let's recover some refrigerant all right that's good enough so I'm gonna go ahead and Push this to, well, that's the out, so this is the in. Close that. Purge. Once that goes to zero, and then I'll go ahead and close that. Close the tank. All right, now closing the liquid line service valve. Liquid line service valve is closed. Now I'm going to disconnect my adapter cord, but I want to turn the disconnect off before I do that. Adapter cord disconnected now reconnect the wire to this side of the coil all right I can go ahead and disconnect this make sure everything's closed up tight now Insert the B 
bit so we can close the suction line service valve whenever this gauge drops to zero. Of course, it's not gonna drop to zero though because we have a low pressure control. It's gonna stop it from doing that. So I need to adjust that control and then I can talk about the way this operates. Now I wanna explain to you what this is and how this condensing unit operates. It operates off pressure. I'm also gonna show you this wiring diagram and explain to you how this is wired. Now this is a Danfoss KP type LP low pressure control. And this is a compressor safety device. This will keep the compressor and the fan from operating during a low pressure condition. We've got two settings on this device right here and I'm gonna show you those. And you can set each one by removing this locking plate and locking screw. We've got a range setting, which is our cut in, and then we've got a differential setting, which is our cut out. And you can think of the cut in as the upper set point and the differential as the lower set point. Now, let's look at this and I'm gonna explain what we're gonna do to make the system run even when there's a lower pressure so we can pump the system down. That way I can get the refrigerant into the condensing unit. I'm going to explain the two yellow wires that go to this pressure control and this little copper tube. So first copper tube, where does this go? That copper tube goes into the suction line and it goes into the suction line right after the suction line service valve and right before the compressor. It's measuring the low side of the system, the suction pressure, and that goes up to the low pressure control. Then we've got two yellow wires, and you can see that yellow wire goes into the contactor. And on the schematic, you can see it says low pressure switch. So it's in series with one side of that contactor coil. So unless this pressure switch closes, and you can see it closes on a rise in pressure, it opens on a fall in pressure or a decrease in pressure. So whenever the pressure rises, the low pressure switch closes, and then that sends power to the contactor coil, C1, and that will energize this contactor. And when it does, it sends power to the fan motor and the compressor. Now, here's our settings, right? This is our range setting and our differential. Range is our cut in, or our upper set point. And whatever you set this for, if the pressure gets above that setting, then switch will close. That will send power to the contactor coil. Then you have your differential. And this is a setting for your lower set point. So whenever the pressure drops below this setting, then your pressure switch will open and that will de-energize the contactor coil or it will break the circuit going to the contactor coil. So you can see right now it's set for about 30 PSIG. So if the suction pressure rises above 30, then the condensing unit will operate, the compressor and fan will be energized and they'll come on. And then you can see the differential set for about 10. So that means that uh, 10 minus 30 equals your uh, low set point. So that would be 20. So if it drops below 20 PSIG, then the pressure switch will open and that will de-energize the contactor coil and then your compressor and fan will no longer run. I hope this makes sense and what we're going to do to adjust this, I'm going to show you how. Never try to adjust this without taking the locking plate off. It is going to be very hard for you to adjust this low pressure switch and I would hate for you to damage the pressure switch. It's very easy to take the locking plate off. I'm going to use my needle nose, take the locking plate off. I use two different, I use a slotted or flathead screwdriver and I use a Phillips screwdriver. Flathead screwdriver is going to be used for the differential pressure. And what we're going to do is we're going to use this to set our cut in. And what are we going to set it for? Our cut in is going to be set for zero. And then our cut out is 
we're just gonna leave well we can just leave it yeah we can just leave that all right now the equipment should run i am not going to leave this low pressure switch set for zero that is definitely not something that's going to be good for the compressor you never want to set it so low that your compressor is in a vacuum you never want to set it so low that you're operating at a harmful pressure for the compressor and i never usually have to adjust these they're always adjusted correctly for the temperature that i'm going to use in my box but you want to set these according to your box temperature and there's a chart i'll show you all right it's alive it's operating all right all right close this valves will be closed and then turn the power off but you can see it's staying running and that's because we adjusted that low pressure switch all right, so here is the install manual for this equipment, and it says recommended low pressure control settings for outdoor air cooled condensing units. We got the cut in pressure, which is the range, and we've got the cut out pressure, which is the differential. So for this, we got a minimum expected ambient temperature and a box set point temperature. My box set point temperature is going to be no more than 30. So my cut in is going to be 30, and my cut out is going to be 5. And that's how I figure that out. Make sure you look at the refrigerant you're using. We're using R404A. And if you want to know, this information right here is Heatcraft Worldwide Refrigeration Installation and Operations Manual. Read your manuals. Awesome information. All right, we got the refrigerant pump down. I'm going to take the solenoid off or the solenoid coil like that and then I think I'm gonna cut it right here and then I'll probably cut it right here in the middle like that all right so oh not a lot of room buddy I gotta cut this one first Just a little bit and then cut it right here all right so I cut the liquid line solenoid out I am going to unbraze these connections so I can put two new pieces of copper in because it can't go this way it's got to go this way and I want to uh, mount it in the horizontal position I don't want to mount it in the vertical position. So I'm going to go ahead and put two new pieces of copper in, get it ready. And I've already got my RLS fitting here. And I'm going to put one up there. And we are going to be in good shape. Now here's how the liquid line solenoid valve was installed before with the end on this side. But we're going to install it like this. And that's the reason I've welded a couple pieces of copper on here to make it fit. I've got my RLS fittings on there. And now we're gonna take our two pieces of copper and we're gonna mark our depth. So take my little depth marking gauge here, put it on, there's one. And then here's the other. Now the liquid that flows from the condenser through the liquid line and up into the evaporator will be able to flow through and we won't have a temperature difference like we did before, and I'll show you the difference after we, it's installed and it's running. But the liquid flows from the condenser through the liquid line, out of the condenser inside the box, inside the evaporator, and then it comes out the suction line, and then it goes outside through the suction line to the condenser into the compressor, out of the discharge line, back into the condenser, out of the liquid line, back into the evaporator. Oh, through the liquid line. Uh, 
solenoid and then so now make sure I can't really see so I need to make sure I put it into the correct depth all right Ugh. there now it's installed doesn't look the greatest but it'll do the job now let's take the RLS tool really don't like this but it's what it is It's in there, and this liquid line solenoid can be wired for 230 or 115 volt. Now these fans are 230. Yeah, so we wired this liquid line solenoid for 230 volts. Now I'm going to put this back in its place. All right. Now let's go put some nitrogen pressure through the gauges into this coil, pressure test it, make sure we soap test this, and had to stop because I just realized I did not use the RLS tool on this side of this coupling. Thankfully I caught it, also my son who's holding the video camera said, I was going to tell you that you forgot to use the RLS tool, but I didn't forget. I did forget, but I didn't forget because I remembered after I forgot. That means I still forgot. <laughs> All right, let's go get some nitrogen on the outdoor unit. Opening up the gauges, make sure your hoses are connected to the service valves before my low side hose is connected over here. And there's refrigerant in the condensing unit. I wanna make sure I don't put nitrogen in there. Got it opened up, nitrogen tank connected to the regulator. All right, we're gonna add some nitrogen. Got the vacuum pump ready, micron gauge attached. Put 275 pounds of nitrogen inside the line sets and the evaporator. I'm gonna hold and make sure that the gauge pressure doesn't drop. We're gonna hold it for 30 minutes and then I'm going to hook up the vacuum pump after I release the nitrogen and pull a really good vacuum. Explaining the refrigerant flow again while we're outside, refrigerant flows from the evaporator through the suction pipe right here, or the vapor pipe. It goes into the inlet side of the compressor and then it goes out the discharge pipe. This is the outlet, this is the inlet. After it goes out of the discharge pipe, it then goes into the condenser. And when it comes out of the condenser, it comes out through the liquid line. And then it goes through the liquid line service valve and then into the liquid line solenoid valve and then into the evaporator and then back out through the suction line. The vacuum pump is hooked up to the gauges. I'm keeping the valves closed. Now we're gonna open it up. And we're gonna turn it on. Turn on the micron gauge and then open the ballast. All right. All right, time to close the ballast. And we wait. While I'm waiting on the vacuum pump, I'm gonna to explain to you how this happened. How could I install the liquid line solenoid the wrong way? This was an example of not paying attention and not being thorough. I had a new technician working with me that hasn't been in the field for a year, and I'm teaching him and training him, and I was focused on him learning how to braze, so I put all the pipe connections together for him out here, and I gave him the liquid line solenoid valve. And I said, it needs to be installed in this direction, and I said, I'm gonna come back and we're gonna nitrogen pressure test. We're gonna see if we missed any spots. And when I got back, he had already finished the brazing. And I was like, wow, that's great. I went inside, I looked at the liquid line solenoid valve, but I didn't look at the way it was installed. I just looked and saw that it was installed and I said, good job. And I came out here and he missed maybe one spot. We fixed it, we, we started it up, 
I charged it, check the Supreme left. Then I come back because it's frozen solid because of course we've got that pressure drop and the pressures you can see are not very high when the unit's running. And I found it and I, I thought to myself, wow, how could I have not checked it? But I didn't, I didn't check it and I called the technician, I told him what happened, he said, I'm sorry. I said, it's not your fault, it's my fault. I was in charge, I was the one that was supposed to teach you the right way to do things, but I'm glad that this happened because this is a great example of not paying attention what can happen, of not being thorough what can happen. Did I mean for this to happen? No, but it happened. And now I get an example to show you of what happens when you do this. So vacuum's almost finished. Let's go ahead and get the valves open and get this thing working. Looks like we're almost there, 300 microns. Now ready to open the valves. The valves are open, I put the caps back on, I turn the disconnect on, and I change the settings on the low pressure control. Before it was on zero for the cut in, so right now it would be running, but I changed the settings and I made the cut in 30, and I made the differential 10. See, 30 for the cut in, that means pressure on the suction side, low side pressure has to rise above that cut in, that 30 PSIG for the condensing unit to run, and then it has to drop uh, 10 PSI, which is the differential, which would be 20 PSIG for it to cut off. So what makes it cut on? What makes it cut off? Pressure. And if that liquid line solenoid valve opens, then that makes the pressure rise. If it closes, it makes the pressure go down or fall. So we're gonna go adjust the room thermostat now. Here's our room thermostat, and we are gonna go below the room temperature. See how it clicked? Whenever we set it below the room temperature, that's when it closes. When it closes, the liquid line solenoid valve opens, right? Whenever it opens, because the room temperature goes below our set point, when that thermostat opens, then that means the liquid line solenoid valve will close. And that will pump down the condenser. It'll go below the cutout and it will shut down. Now let's go ahead and apply power to the uh, room thermostat, liquid line solenoid, apply power to these fans. Fans are running. Did you hear that? Set that about right there. All right, condensing unit is running now. I'm gonna go back inside and measure the difference of temperature across that liquid line solenoid valve. Now we're gonna use the meter and the pipe plant to check the temperature difference. One side of the valve to the other. What's that say? Give it just a few. 58. No, going up a little bit. 58. Let's just 58. All right. Now the other side. 59. 60. 59. All right. So one degree. One degree versus over 10 degrees. So we're in good shape now. 45 degrees on the suction line. That's nice. The pressures are 45 and 160. Sight glass has got a few bubbles in it, not much. So Super Eats about 30 right now. All right. I'm gonna wait, come back in a few hours, recheck the box temperature check the pressure, superheat and subcooling, make sure we have no more issues. This was such an easy mistake that could have been avoided, but I'm glad that it happened because it made for a great video. Let me know if you learned anything. Let me know if you've ever made this mistake in the field working on refrigeration units like this or installing. Our job was to install the condenser, the mechanical room thermostat, and the liquid line solenoid valve. And we installed the valve backwards. And I didn't check it. So my fault, but I hope it was a good video for you. 
thank you so much for watching. If you like the video, hit the like button, subscribe, and smash that bell. Ding! So you know what I'm doing. You want more videos like this? Let me know in the comments, and I'll keep doing Watching HVAC Tips for Technicians, I'm Tad, and I'll keep you cool if you let me.